Hello everyone, thanks for stopping in. Today we're going to talk about Math 121, Section 2.2, which deals with histograms. A histogram is a bar graph where all bars are adjacent and have equal width. All bars are adjacent of equal width. Additionally, the horizontal scale, horizontal scale is for data values. And the vertical is for frequencies. So the horizontal scale is for data values and the vertical scale is for frequency values. Think of a histogram as a bar graph version of a frequency table. That is the best way to think of a histogram. It's a bar graph version of the tables we've already been working with. And so let's look at an example. Let's create one. Let's look at this example from last class, the McDonald's service time example. You may want to pause and take a moment to copy it down because we're going to turn this into a histogram. Well, for a histogram, we're going to draw an L for our axes. Notice I put a little bit of a lightning bolt symbol here. That's because I'm going to skip some numbers. I want to start at 75. I need to skip some values, right? My horizontal is always the data values themselves, so service times in seconds. The vertical is always frequency. And for the vertical scale, I need to get up to the number 23. I'm going to count by fives. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25. Feel free to scale as you need, right? We need to get up to 23, so I counted by fives to get to 25. Now, the horizontal scale, it's very important you label the horizontal scale correctly. The first dash, we start at 75. If you remember the class boundaries though, the class boundary on the lower end was 74.5 and then on the upper end was 124.5. Remember it's the number halfway between the classes, right? It's the class boundary. Those are the numbers that go here. Now, after 124.5, the next boundary is 174.5. Make sure you're equally spacing them as best you can. Next comes 224.5. Next comes 274.5, right? And then the last one would be 324.5. I put the boundary numbers, the class boundaries there. Now, how tall do I make each bar? Well, between 74.5 and 125, I have a frequency of 12. So I'll draw a vertical bar up to 12. And I like to put a little 12 on top, so I know that it went up to 12. And that's my first bar. My second bar needs to touch this bar, and it's between these two values, it's 23. So it's gonna be connected to this and go up to 23. Notice the bars are touching. That's an important factor in a histogram. The bars should touch, they're adjacent. That went up to 23. Next, I gotta go up to 10. So once again, the bars need to touch and I go up to 10, right? It's a little lower than 12. Next, three. So three will be somewhere down maybe about here. Three, and then two will be a little bit shorter for that last category, right? And this, is the histogram for the frequency table we saw earlier. Notice we use the class boundary numbers here and frequency here, and then I drew the bars touching. Those are all important to make sure you have the horizontal is your data and has your class boundaries, the vertical is your frequency, and the bars touch. Those are all important properties. What are some uses of histograms? Now, why do we use histograms? First, it visually displays the distribution of data. The distribution of data. 
it shows whether the data are spread out or bunched up. If we look here, there's a big bunch right here, right? There's a big chunk right there. It's the biggest chunk of data right here. As we go up towards the bigger numbers, it t trails off, right? I can see the distribution of the data. It also shows the location of the center of the data. If I try to find the center in this data, I know that it's going to be somewhere in here, right? This is halfway between each side. If you try and think about balancing this shape on the end of your pen, the point of balance is going to be somewhere in the center of the mass, right? It shows you the location of the center. It also shows the spread of the data. It shows whether the data is spread out or all bunched up. This data is pretty bunched up right here, right? Then there's a little bit of spread out to the right. It shows us whether we're really spread out or really bunched up, right? It shows us the spread. It also can identify outliers. If there was one bar all alone by its lonesome way off on either end, that would be an outlier, right? It's outside the rest of the data. It lies outside of the norm. There might be a number way bigger or way smaller than the rest that stands alone. We can also see if there are any of those from our graph, right? So that's a histogram, and it has a couple of uses, right? The biggest one is it visually displays the data, right? It's a visual picture. It's a nice graphical picture of the data. The other ones are less important. The biggest one is the visual displaying. Now, there's also what's called a relative frequency histogram. And this is a histogram that reports relative frequency. Which, if you remember, the relative frequency is percentages, right? That's where you find those percentages. It's a histogram that reports relative frequency. So here is our relative frequency table from last section, right? This is the table we used last class. We've already seen this table. Let's take a look at the histogram. So I'm going to draw my vertical lines with a little teeny like lightning bolt symbol right here, right? My relative frequencies, those go on the vertical. So I'm going to keep track of relative frequency right here. Relative frequency. The biggest number is 46. Maybe I'll count by tens, right? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. That gets me above 46. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50. And these are percentages, right? So I might want to put a little percent sign here to remind myself their percentages, right? I might want to put that in the um, table. Now, you still put the class boundaries here. So I'm still going to put 74.5 as my starting point. And then the next one, remember, 124.5, 174.5, 175.5, 175.5. Two seventy-four point five and three twenty-four point five. Right? These are the boundary numbers that are halfway between each of the limits. Right? The boundary values, the class boundaries. Now I draw my bars. Twenty-four percent. That'll be about here. And I like to put a little twenty-four percent on top, just because I'm hand drawing it. Right? I want to be able to signify that I know the value. The bar is still touched. It's still a histogram. So my next bar will touch and go up to 46%, right? That's about 46%. Come on down, 46%. Next would be 20%. That's chilling right about here. 20%. Next would be 6. That's going to be a little below 10. 6%. And then last will be 4%. That'll be a little below 6, right? 4%. And that is a relative frequency histogram. Notice all I'm doing is taking the table and converting it into a bar graph. We have two different flavors of histograms, just like we had multiple flavors of frequency tables, right? Now look at something. Look at the shape. Does this shape look wildly different from this shape? It doesn't, does it? These look pretty similar. I hand drew them. The book has nice computer-generated images that look exactly the same. 
They should be the same shape. And that's our note here. The shape of a histogram and a relative frequency histogram should be the same. Histogram should be the same. Because you're graphing the same data, you're just changing the measurement from a whole frequency number to a percentage. You're not changing the data in any way, you're just changing the way you're keeping track. Do you want to talk about percentages or frequency values? Relative frequencies, which are percentages, or regular frequencies, which are just whole numbers, right? The shape doesn't change, so be wary of the shape, right? It should stay the same. Now, what is a distribution? A distribution is the shape of a graph or data set. And I use the word shape as a general term, right? We'll see there's several different distribution types. We're actually going to talk about four common distributions. The first one is uniform. And let's draw a quick example of a histogram that is uniform. So maybe we've got some bars, right? Maybe some are taller than others, but they're all roughly the same height. They have a nice uniform height. They all have roughly the same height. Think about people wearing uniforms generally look fairly similar, right? Because they're wearing a uniform. Uniform height, fairly similar in heights. They can be a little different, but they should be extremely close across the graph. Uniform. The next is normal, which some of you might know as bell. And this one, if I draw my shape and I start drawing in some bars, it should peak somewhere in the middle and then taper off on each side so that the overall shape takes a nice bell looking shape. It looks kind of like a bell, right? The overall shape is kind of like a bell. That's why it's called the bell curve. We will call it the normal distribution. So get used to the word normal when talking about this type of distribution. Normal. Bell just helps you remember the shape. The name of the distribution is normal. We also have two other types. These kind of go hand in hand. And these are skewed left. And if we can skew left, we can also be skewed right. And let's draw an example of each of these. Let's draw a skewed left first. This is a histogram that starts off fairly low, peaks, and then ends abruptly. It has a long left tail. There's a long tail on the left, right? If I draw the shape, there's a long tail on the left. That's why it's skewed left. For skewed right, same thing but to the right. We'll start off with an abrupt climb up and then a slow taper off to the right. Maybe we have one more, right? Skewed right. It comes up abruptly and then tapers off with a tail to the right. Skewed right has its tail to the right. And these are the four shapes, I guess, Let's put a line across the uniform one. We see it's generally a straight line, right? We see it's generally a straight line across uniform. That's an example of each of the distributions. Uniform, normal, skewed left, skewed right. Now, how can you remember skewed left versus skewed right? Well, let's take a look at a way to remember. The way I remember is the word skewed. Skewed reminds me of skewer, which reminds me of toasting marshmallows. If you think about a marshmallow skewer, right, you got like a stick and you're going to stab a marshmallow on the end, right? Here's our marshmallow, right? We're going to stab it. You stab a marshmallow, toast it. You stab it with the skewer. If I wanted to use this graph 
the skewed left graph to stab a marshmallow, which end would be better for stabbing? The left side, right? It's got the long pointed tail. Skewed left, skewer left, toast marshmallow with left side. Same for skewed right. This end's better for stabbing a marshmallow, so I'll use skewed right. Because if I wanted to toast a marshmallow with my graph, that end would be the skewer, right? That is how I remember skewed left versus skewed right. I believe the book talks about feet, left versus right foot. Feel free to look at that as well. That's another mnemonic device they help remember. But I always use skewers, skewed left, skewed right. So that is an option you have as well. Now, let's take one last example create a frequency table and matching histogram for the following list of student heights. Use the minimum data value as the first lower limit and a class width of three. Class width of three, first lower limit is minimum. So let's see, it looks like the data's in order. So that's my minimum. So the minimum is 60 and the question told me the width was three. I don't need to calculate it. The question just gave me the width. I don't need to use the formula to calculate it, right? It just gave me the width. Well, I can dive on in. I'm keeping track of height. And I want to make a frequency table, right? Well, my first lower limit is 60. And I use the width to get my next lower limits. 63, 66, 69, 72. The next would be 75, right? If I go up by three again. But I'm going to stop because I don't need 75, do I? My max was 73. This will cover all of my data. I'm going to put a little 75 so we remember we don't need it. But you don't need to write the 75 here. You don't need it. Because now I do my upper limits, right? You do your lower limits first. Do I have decimals in any of my numbers? Looks like no. They're all whole numbers, aren't they? So what's the smallest whole number? Or what's the whole number smaller than 63? Is 62. If I had decimals, I could put 62.9. If I had two decimal places, I could put 62.99. Remember, you always consider your decimals, right? 66 tells me 65 comes before it, then 68, then 71. Then this last one, remember the 75 helps you remember it goes to 74. And those are my class limits. Now, I need to put my data in. Lucky for me, it's sorted. Let's see, 60 to 62 looks like one, two, three, four. So there'll be four for the frequency. 63 to 65, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Looks like I got five. 66 to 68, let's see, one, two, three, four. Back to four. 69 to 71, let's see, one, two, three, four. Looks like four. And then 72 to 74 looks like two for the last one, right? My data was in order, makes it a little easier for me if my data is in order, right? Now, that was review. We already knew how to make a table. However, we need to make a histogram now. So, I'm gonna draw a histogram. We'll take a vertical bar. Once again, we start at 60 for our height, so we'll take a little lightning bolt to tell us we're skipping to 60. We're measuring height and frequency. Let's see, I go up to five, so maybe one, two, three, four, five. Seems like a good way to scale it, right? Just count to five. What number goes first? Well, I need to think about the boundary values. What boundary value would come first? Well, it would be 59 and a half. Because this class would be 59 ending, so halfway between. Next, between 62 and 63 would be 62 and a half. Then 65 to 66 would be 65 and a half. 68 to 69 would be 68 and a half. And then 71 to 72 would be 71 and a half. And then my end cap would be 74 and a half, right? Notice they're all three apart, right? Always The width is always three. Everything's always three apart. So those are my boundary values, right? They're the boundary between the two classes. And then I just got a graph up to four, up four, and then up to five, and then I'm at four for the next two, so I'll draw over for two, and I'll come down in between. Notice the bars are touching. It's a histogram. The bars have to touch. And then lastly, we got two, and I'll draw like that. 
Maybe here it's kind of obvious what numbers because they're all whole numbers, right? One, two, three, four, five. My scale's pretty clear. Maybe I don't label the tops. Maybe I do, right? Five, four, 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 or two. Totally up to me whether I want to label those or not. So that's a frequency table and a histogram. Notice I have to make the table in order to make the histogram. You need the table first. The histogram is just a graph representing this table. This table is represented by this graph, right? And that brings us to the end of section 2.2. Thank you all for joining me, and I will see you next time.